This is what br broadly what we're going to try to do uh, in the next 40 minutes or so. Um, what, what we're talking about really are, I suppose, new developments within um, social network analysis, but in order to be able to, to do that, and working on the assumption that some of you won't know what social network analysis is in the first place, we're going to just spend uh, five or ten minutes uh, introducing social network analysis in its standard, usual format, um, which is quantitative, which, which involves numbers and, and mathematical um, ideas. Uh, then, where, when I've done that, uh, Gemma will introduce some purely qualitative um, modes of social network analysis to you, and some of the thinking that's gone into um, developing qualitative approaches to network analysis. She'll then switch a bit and talk about mixing methods, about how we can take these qualitative methods and use them alongside the, um, the, the more standard um, social network analytic methods. And then I'll come in at the end for, for the last five or ten minutes and just try and give you some fairly basic examples of how the two things might, uh, the, the qualitative and the quantitative elements of social network analysis might be used together. Okay, so, so what is uh, social network analysis? Well, really, we, we need to start uh, uh, by saying what, what is a, uh, a network. <clears throat> so in, in, within social network analysis, a, um, a, a network is defined as basically comprising two sets. It comprises a set of nodes, that's these little blue or these little red squares that, that you can see here, it involves a set of ties, which is what's represented by the, um, the, the, the line connecting the nodes. Um, and in some cases, it might involve a set or a set of attributes. So you can see that some of these nodes here are red and some of these nodes are blue. Now, your nodes can be whatever is meaningful in terms of your project. It might be human beings. It might be cities, it might be organisations, anything that really that is capable of having the type of relationship, the type of tie that you are um, that, that you are interested in. Again, the ties can be of whatever kind you are interested in. You might be interested in um, economic exchanges. You might be interested in gossip. Who talks to who? You might be interested in the transmission of diseases. Uh, you might be interested in migration patterns. These might be countries or cities, and, uh, and, and the lines might indicate migration from one um, to, to, to the other. Again, it doesn't really um, matter. And, and finally, attributes, insofar as you, you bring them in, are, are again entirely unrestricted as far as the the method is concerned. And this is because I, I guess the, the method is, um, is in essence highly formal. What it's interested in is, or what it allows you to look at, are the patterns of connection. So what's connected and what the basis of connection is, is, is really from the point of view of, of the method, it, uh, beside the point, because what, what's of interest is the, um, uh, is the pattern. And I guess that's both a strength there and, and the weakness of the approach. And uh, SNA uh, allows us to, to look at and to analyze properties at various different kinds of levels. So to, to give you some simple examples, we might be interested in the level of the node. And one thing that we might be interested in, for example, is how well connected nodes are within a network. So these nodes here, each of these two, only seem to have one tie. Whereas this node here it seems to have 20, 30 ties to other people. So that's, that's one thing that we might be interested in. We might be interested in the, the position that a node has within, um, within the network. Alternatively, we might be interested in the whole thing, or pro properties that the whole network uh, has. I'll show you a, a comparison later in the talk that might help to bring this um, help to bring this home. But for example, we might be interested in what's called the density of the network, which is a measure of how many ties there are in the network expressed as a proportion of the total 
number of ties that are possible within that within a network. So some networks are very sparse; hardly anybody is tied to anybody. Others are very very dense; uh, almost everybody is tied to everybody else. Um, sometimes we're we're interested in dyads. We might be interested, for example, in reciprocity. Um, so so one way we can approach network analysis looking at a tie between two people, is to say, do I send a tie to Gemma? Does Gemma send a tie um, to me? So that in that case, a tie might be liking. It might be the case that I like Gemma. That doesn't necessarily mean that she likes me. She might, she might not. So, so the tie could be reciprocated, might not be. And we, and we might be interested in relationships of reciprocation. Another thing we're sometimes interested in is, uh, is triads. You can see... Around here, there are lots of, uh, of, of triangles. And again, this, this is a, a feature, a process within networks that we are sometimes interested in. We're interested in, for example, the tendency of friends to become friends with their friends' friends, if you see what I mean, what's, what's referred to as, um, as, as transitivity. So um, if, uh, if I know Gemma and Mark knows Gemma, that might increase the likelihood that the two of us know one another, not least because both knowing Gemma, she might introduce us to, to one another at some point in time. So we can be interested in the, the properties of triadic um, relationships. And finally, what we're also sometimes interested in are particular regions of a network or particular sub-networks. So you can see within this graph here that there's a, there's a really dense patch here, it seems as if all of these people in this part of the network are really strongly connected to one another, um, as opposed to what's going on out, out here where, where the, the ties are much uh, sparser. So what, what, what another level that we might pitch in at is the level of these particular subsections and how they are internally related, but also how they, they relate to, uh, to, to one another. Uh, what, what, I've, what I've showed you so far is what we refer to as a whole network. So we have a, a, a population of actors, or, or whatever the nodes are, um, a predefined population, and we try to determine the, the ties between every member of that, that population. So we might take a group like this, um, like this, this class here, and we want to know in the case of each person in the class, who else within the class they are uh, that they are tied to and who they're not tied to. Um, that, that's a, a whole network analysis. Another thing that we can do though is what's called an ego net analysis, which is a network that's centered upon individuals. And this is something that's easier to do, for example, by postal questionnaire. So if I was interviewing Gemma for a project, I might ask her about her seven or eight best friends and their relationships to one another and to her and, um, and, and so on. Or, or I might ask her to name everybody that she, she talks to on a daily basis or whatever and see their, their, their relationships. And then thirdly, we have uh, what, what's called uh, two or multi-mode networks. And this is where we're interested in relationships between two types of things or perhaps three or four types of things. So we might be interested in um, relationships between people and events. A very famous early study um, was focused on um, ladies who lunch, if you like, and uh, there were two types of nodes within the network. There were the lunches and there were the ladies, and the ladies were linked to the lunches. So, so if you went to a lunch, that was a tie between you and that activity and, and so on. Or we've, uh, Gemma and I have done some work on the suffragettes and on particular protests and events. So we, t we had one of our modes was the individual activists and another of our modes was the events that they participated in. And you can analyze a, a network in, um, in, in that way. So network analysis, I mean, I mean obviously that was a very, very brief thumbnail sketch of it, but that approach to, to network analysis is rooted in, in mathematics. It's rooted in a, a form of mathematics called graph theory, but it grew, um, the network analysis grew in large part out of the efforts of ethnographers 
to really to try and make sense of complex relational patterns that they encountered within the field. And, and uh, important amongst these were a group of anthropologists from, um, from, from Manchester back in, in the 1960s. So they would go out to particular villages um, and, or, and their, their various informants would be talking about oh, this person and that person and they work together and they do this and they do that. And the anthropologists were finding that this, this um, uh, information, this data about relations, about who interacts with who, was, was too complex to manage in a narrative, discursive way. There was just too much going on to, for, to possibly be able to process and comprehend in the standard narrative ways that you, uh, that, that you might do that um, ordinarily in the context of, of an ethnography. And so they, they turned to graph theory as a way of, um, of, of trying to work with this sort of data. And there have been uh, huge advances on the math side in recent years, and particularly in relationship to statistics. Graph theory isn't statistics, and it's, it's a very, in many respects, a very different form of mathematics. It works in, a, in quite a, a different way. Um, but nevertheless, in recent years, statistics has become more and more important in relationship to network analysis and sort of bringing the graph theory and the statistics to, uh, together. Um, and computing advances have made uh, these, these techniques and these ideas very widely accessible. I mean, it's very complicated mathematics, but to you and me, you just press a button, and as long as you know what you've done in pressing the button, roughly, you're, you're, you're able to work with, the, with these kinds of, um, of things. And this has meant, I think, or, or at least some people feel, that this has meant that network analysis has become very quantitative um, in approach, and the the ethnographic um, uh, information and detail that was once integral to it has, um, has, has dropped out. And, and the mixed methods approaches really are a way of trying to restore the balance, trying to put some of the, the qualitative information and data uh, back in. This is where Jenny okay, comes in. Yeah, this is where I come in at. Okay, um, so as Nick's kind of described the method um, so far, it seems kind of largely quantitative, despite the fact it's had uh, these kind of roots in, in anthropology at Manchester. Um, so I want to kind of consider now, you know, in what sense could qualitative methods be used um, with formal kind of social network analysis? Um, but kind of before I do that, I just want to flag up as well that social network analysis doesn't have to mean a kind of quantitative method, that there are some people that do uh, social network analysis from a kind of purely qualitative uh, perspective. Um, and uh, Sue Heath is someone who recently has, has um, done projects where she's used a purely kind of qualitative social network analysis method. And she said that actually sociologists and social scientists have been working with this kind of relational data for quite some time. It's kind of integral to what we do. We're interested in relationships, but obviously also interested in the kind of patterning of those relationships and how they affect what people do on a daily basis. Uh, so going back to people in social theory like George Simmel, for example, uh, this sort of you know, web of relationships has always been important to kind of questions that qualitative researchers have had. So Sue Heath kind of argues that even though um, people doing this kind of research haven't sort of self-styled themselves as qualitative social network analysts, that's kind of essentially what they've kind of been doing and that perhaps we should start to consciously kind of label ourselves qualitative social network analysis a bit so that we can show there is a different tradition that runs alongside the kind of more formal quantitative tradition. Um, but the kind of work that Nick and I have done uh, using qualitative methods and network analysis has, has been more to try and mix them in with the formal methods because we think actually there's a lot of value in having them run alongside one another. Um, and I think social network analysis offers quite a particular opportunity for trying to mix um, quantitative and qualitative methods. Um, that networks as kind of phenomena have both a kind of processual kind of like aspect to them and a structural aspect to them. That kind of processes of social interaction are what create networks in the first place and create the kind of patterning and structure that we find in them. So networks are kind of simultaneously both structure and process. And therefore, it's difficult to categorise networks as a phenomena as either something that's quantitative or qualitative in the way that we might try to categorise other social phenomena. So it kind of offers, some people have said, a, quite a unique opportunity for actually integrating 
uh, quantitative and qualitative methods in quite a kind of meaningful way. And I think also by bringing qualitative methods into more kind of formal social network analysis, um, we kind of acknowledge that if we're actually going to understand anything about these diagrams, I mean, they look, they look very exciting and elaborate, these big kind of pictures that we can draw of networks. Um, and you know, we, can, we can create all sorts of statistics to help us describe their structure. But if we actually want to understand or interpret any of those measures or patterns, then we need qualitative methods because we need to understand the content of ties, not just the structure of them, and what the meaning of those ties have for the people within the network. Um, so, so this is kind of an acknowledgement that the qualitative is not just a kind of nice addition to the formal network analysis, but that actually a kind of essential component of trying to, trying to understand networks. Uh, so there's been some kind of various theoretical arguments put across um, in terms of why it should be that we should bring qualitative methods into network analysis. Um, and some people have argued that some kinds of questions about networks actually require us to take a more qualitative approach. Um, so um, someone within the business literature called Monstead, who's done a, a study of people who are trying to set up new businesses, has argued that actually formal social network analysis is um, it finds it very difficult to look at ties that are just emerging um, and it's kind of quite biased to work towards looking at people's established ties. Uh, so they did a kind of formal network analysis um, of um, entrepreneurs um, and they also interviewed entrepreneurs and they found that those emerging ties, the kind of new ties, were very difficult to capture in the diagrams, but they came out very much when you interviewed the entrepreneurs. Uh, some people said, you know, if we want to look at the kind of process of fluid aspects of networks rather than the structure, then we need uh, qualitative methods. And also, if we want to look at how networks change over time, those diagrams tend to give us quite a static snapshot of networks, whereas we might actually be interested more in questions of, of change. Um, and one of the main arguments that's been made for combination uh, has been that, that qualitative and quantitative methods can kind of get to two different parts of networks. And that the qualitative is very good for getting to what um, Jack calls the insider view of networks. So the perception of a network of somebody who's within the network, uh, which could be quite different from the overall patterning of the network um, that you could get, you might call the quantitative aspects of getting to the outsider view of networks. Uh, so it's been argued that, that by combining uh, quantitative and qualitative methods, we can look at both the insider and the outsider view of the network and therefore get a more complete picture, more complete understanding. Um, but I think there's some problems with, with, with thinking of the qualitative as getting to the inside and the quantitative as getting to the outside. Because the kind of unique thing about the networks is that quantitative and qualitative don't so much get to different aspects as they get to the same aspect in different ways. Um, and I think in that respect, the work of uh, somebody like Anne Mishk is very interesting uh, for, for people who are interested in kind of the qualitative aspects of networks. And she argues that networks are essentially these processes, discursive processes of communicative interaction. Um, and it's through the communicative interaction that we create these kind of network structures in the first place. And that we need to kind of stop seeing networks as, if you like, the locations for um, cultural practices and, uh, and discourses and start seeing them as constituted through these kind of processes in the first place. Uh, and once we kind of see networks as actually constituted, by kind of cultural processes and communicative processes, then using qualitative methods becomes kind of an essential ingredient in actually understanding them. Um, so I just want to say a bit now about how we might bring qualitative methods into um, uh, social network analysis. And, and the first thing I want to talk about is how those purely kind of qualitative uh, network analysts have gone about looking at networks. And if you like, they've designed some of their own tools for trying to elicit network data. So within the quantitative tradition, the main way to, um, to kind of generate your network data is through a survey. So they call them name generator surveys. You design a survey which can collect data about you know, who knows whom and how they're connected. Uh, within qualitative um, social network analysis, they, they've got their own ways of, of kind of generating names. Um, the first one is called participatory mapping which is where you actually kind of create a bit of a network diagram within the course of an interview. Uh, so this is a participatory map that was created by an interviewee um, in a project by Clark and Emil uh, called the Connected Lives Project. And the Connected Lives Project was looking at 
people's networks within um, communities and neighbourhoods um, and how they kind of formed and changed and broke down over time. Um, so they interviewed uh, people about their networks and within the interview they brought in pens and kind of post-it notes and all sorts and asked people to kind of draw out uh, the people who were kind of important <coughs> to them and talk about how they were connected. And the idea with kind of participatory mapping techniques is I guess you, you kind of draw out your own rough picture of those nice pretty diagrams Nick showed at the beginning. Um, so it's a kind of, I don't know, a sort of messier kind of way to do it. Um, but at the same time, the idea is it doesn't just generate names, but it also helps you to move through processes of analysing and theorising the net network with your interviewee. So as the interviewee kind of draws out their different social circles and puts people in different boxes, they themselves start to kind of like analyse and theorise their own connections. And you can see this in the kind of narrative uh, that they give about the network. So this is one of their examples of somebody drawing out their network saying, Oh, yeah, you know, so when I worked at the community centre, I was there for six months and I knew people like Ty, he's the manager, and Anna, I'll put her down here because, well, these are like my work people, uh, in a more scary square box, but the work people are there. Uh, okay, and then, you know, in a fuzzy nice one, I, I met Anna there, well, I'll put Anna in that, but I also now work with her, okay, so that's the square box, yes, the scariest one of all. <clears throat> So as people kind of start to map out their own networks, they also kind of give this narrative account, which kind of categorizes people, interprets what their relationships are like to other people. So it's not just a case of generating kind of names for network analysis, but also generating those kind of narrative accounts about what the ties actually mean to people. Um, other approaches that have been used, uh, Bettina Holstein uses a kind of concentric circles approach. So everyone's sort of seen maybe from geography a long time ago, those kind of uh, concentric circles, a series of, of circles um, where you can ask people to put the people they feel closest to maybe in the, the centre circle and then move outwards and people who are just acquaintances kind of on the outer circle. Um, and Holstein kind of uses this to look at um, people's friendship networks post-divorce and, and, and how kind of um, friendship networks change um, and, and the kind of position that people have within, within your networks. Um, walking interviews were also used in the Connected Lives project. So um, a researcher would actually take someone from the local community and ask that person to walk them around the local community. And as they did so, they bumped into various people. They went to the places they normally go, the corner shop and what have you. Uh, they recorded the kind of interactions and the kind of um, uh, ties that, that, that were actually present in their kind of everyday lives. Uh, communication diaries are, have also been used. Um, you ask somebody to keep a diary for a certain amount of time and record all of their interactions or interactions of a certain type within the diary. Um, I've been using historical diaries in the project um, on the suffragettes, so some suffragette diaries and going through those and reading them and trying to record the kind of relationships of, of who sees who on a daily basis. You obviously get like really rich data from that, but it's also quite frustrating because it takes absolutely ages to <laughs> kind of pick all these names out and, and analyse them. Um, so there's a question with the kind of qualitative methods of, of getting network data is how much detail do you go before you, you know, you start to become sort of ineffective in your time. Um, and an, another method is to actually do interviews with both the egos and the alters. So within a kind of ego net, a personal network, to interview the person whose network it is, and then to follow up some of those people they've named as important to them and interview them. Um, and Sue Heath used this method in a, the project that she did on um, how young people 18 come to decide whether or not they go to university. So she spoke to that young person and then she spoke to the people that that young person named as having an influence upon them, which most of the time were family and, and close friends. And then she interviewed them as well. And what she was looking for really was the shared discourses that, that there were around that person and how they became common themes and ideas became reflected in that young person's account. So within some families, maybe an idea that, you know, university is a waste of time, the university of life is better, you know. There's kind of like these shared kind of ideas about the world that that young person kind of assimilates. So it's quite an interesting way of looking at the effect of, of the network on the person. Um, so whilst you can therefore kind of go off on network analysis in a completely qualitative direction, um, the formal techniques can also become really useful. And one of the reasons why is that 
it, it makes it a lot easier to kind of handle and store your data. Uh, so whilst you could go off and do these network diagrams with pen and paper, having a kind of computer software package, and we use obviously UCI net, uh, having got Martin Everett here, uh, but there's other ones like Payek, and you can use them to input your um, relational data, data about who knows who. And then it's also very easy to store that data within those packages and also to visualize that data. So at a click of a button, I could create that visual diagram of somebody's network. Um, and it can just be kind of a lot, a lot more of an effective way to kind of see the patternings that are going on rather than just relying upon the kind of narrative accounts and pictures that they've drawn. Um, and I think from Nick and I's point of view, the kind of quantitative formal side of SNA is really good at helping to grasp the structure of someone's network. So actually being able to describe in a kind of systematic and precise terms the, the structure of somebody's network, how dense is it, who are the central players within it, are there various cliques, it helps you to think about important questions. You can't necessarily see that and, and analyse it so precisely, um, remaining at the kind of qualitative level. Um, and also then if you wanted to compare those kind of statistics across people's networks, that, that could be something you can do in a more precise way. Um, okay, so we kind of mix methods um, at various levels of or stages of network projects. So um, people talk in, in, in social research methods about moments of mixing methods. You don't just mix methods at one stage of a project, they can be mixed at lots of different stages and I think within social network um, projects there's lots of opportunities to kind of be innovative in the way in which you introduce qualitative methods into more formal SNA projects um, and it would be wrong to kind of say that formal SNA hasn't always kind of done this to some extent um, so over the last couple of decades a lot of um, kind of self-styled quantitative social network uh, projects have at some point used an interview or an element of ethnography uh, at some stage in their kind of research design. Um, so some people have used ethnography, for example, to inform the kind of questions that they ask on their, their network questionnaires. So the surveys that are sent out to generate names. So people have said, if you want to be able to ask the right kind of questions in the right kind of ways to get that sort of data, then you need to kind of already immerse yourself in that group, the kind of language that they use, and the best way to kind of ask those questions. So uh, one study by um, Nagus and colleagues looked at um, networks of drug injectors in New York City. Um, and before they could actually create a survey that asked people um, about the various contacts that they had, they had a period of ethnography where they sort of hung out with that group. I can't really imagine what that would have been like, but um, to kind of understand what that world was like and what kind of contacts people might have had <laughs> before they could actually ask them to name them. Um, qualitative methods have been used in quite innovative ways within panel studies and longitudinal studies of how people's networks change over time. Uh, so Lubbers has done some interesting work on migrant social networks and they've, they've kind of used interviews to create network diagrams and then at a later date they've interviewed the um, members of the study again and they showed them the network diagram from the previous time period and they've talked to them about how it's changed. So they kind of use the network diagram within interviews to, um, to, as a kind of kickoff to talk to people about how things have changed over time. Um, and also um, people have used uh, the kind of network diagrams uh, to help them select their kind of interviewees for qualitative network analysis. So um, Hepburn did um, a, a study of online uh, networks between uh, various kind of campaigning groups. And through creating the network diagram, who was most central within that, um, actually helped him to choose uh, who he would then go and interview, because uh, he actually kind of didn't know who the central players were within this network beforehand. Um, Harry's did some interesting work on um, climate camp activists here in Manchester, and again used the network diagram to select people who were involved at different levels within climate camp for interview. So it took someone from the central group, someone who was more isolated, um, so that you could then kind of follow up what these different positions in the network really kind of related to in real terms. Um, but I, I think in the way in which Nick and I have, have mixed qualitative methods in is, and I think maybe I'm 
uh, this is a bit more my position than Nick's, but is I sort of argue that network analysis really benefits from privileging qualitative sources or methods of data collection. And that we can actually mix qualitative and quantitative very well at data, the data analysis stage. But if we actually use sources for net generating network data, like interviews and ethnography and historical archives and what have you, that what we can actually do then is give ourselves a lot of flexibility within network projects, both to turn that kind of data into numerical data um, so we can create those maps and we can measure the structure. Then we can also go back to those sources to investigate what those relationships actually mean. Uh, so we can both create the diagrams and we can explore them in qualitative detail if we generate that data from qualitative sources. Um, and Covello sort of argued this by saying that quantitative data maybe it can be unidimensional um, and therefore more restrictive, whereas the qualitative data allows for what, what he calls a bifocal approach to network analysis. Um, but I suppose one of the kind of most popular ways that qualitative methods have been brought in um, to, to formal network analysis is to try and sort of investigate what the diagrams actually mean. Um, so uh, Elisa Bolotti, who's also in the Mitchell Centre uh, here at Manchester, did a study of friendship networks um, in Milan. Um, and she kind of did a name generator survey to create these diagrams of people's personal networks, but then interviewed those people to find out exactly what they kind of meant to them. Because one of the things when we investigate things in social science is that the things we're investigating don't have an essential meaning in the first place. So what friendship was differed uh, according to the different people that she spoke to. Um, so it was really important to have the kind of qualitative interviews in order to actually investigate what the kind of patterns and ties really meant to people. Um, and one of the other interesting studies I just wanted to point up in this respect was Conti and Dorian, who did um, a study of police training academies. Um, and there was... Uh, a kind of um, initiative to try and create kind of racial integration in the police force. So to get black and white police officers and officers and different ethnic identities to, to kind of um, meet one another and become friends at the level of training. And the hope would be that they would keep up these sort of friendships in the police force. And it could be one way to try and maybe overcome some of the divisions that, that people have highlighted. Um, so they did a network analysis of um, these sort of friendship networks within the police training academy. But they did a participant observation alongside it. And the reason why their study is so interesting is the participant observation actually contradicted what they found from the formal social network analysis. So the formal social network analysis showed that, yes, people had these very mixed um, kind of friendship groups, and therefore the initiative on that level looked like it was a great success. But through the participant observation, they could see that by the language people used and, and the whole culture of what was going on, actually racial divisions were kind of a lot more ingrained at a cultural level than could have been captured within the kind of formal um, network diagrams. So sometimes they don't back each other up. They can also contradict each other as well, which can lead to important and interesting tensions that you can follow up within your research. So now I'm going to pass over to Nick, who's going to give some examples some from some research that he's done about integrating the two. Yep. Okay, and so we've done quite a lot of, uh, of, of different kinds of, um, of projects uh, and a lot of my work certainly has been focused on uh, collective action which has often meant social movements and protests. Um, but the first example that, that I wanted to give was of a project that I'm working on at the moment which is about uh, punk music scenes and post-punk music scenes in, um, well, in London, Manchester. Liverpool and, um, and Sheffield. Um, and I think the, the first thing to just to, to go back to what Jen was saying about this is that the, the data from this has all been um, gathered from qualitative sources. Uh, it's all been gathered from documentary sources, in, in particular from books, the, from, from going back and reading endless biographies and histories and, um, and accounts of, um, of, of the period, uh, so in this case between 1974 and 1976, looking to try to identify, firstly, who, these are both in London, so firstly, who the key players were that were involved in the London punk scene. Um, secondly, who 
was related and tied to who uh, uh, and at what particular points in time. Um, and thirdly, how they came to get to know one another and how their relationships and therefore their network was formed. So what I've got here um, is two snapshots. This is the state of play of the relationships between the actors in 1974, uh, beginning of 1974, and this is the state of play of um, the relationships between the actors in December 1976. Uh, so hopefully what's immediately apparent to you from, from the graph is that over that two-year period, a network began to form. I mean, technically, these are both networks, but clearly they're very different because this one, this later one, is very much more connected. In fact, everybody has some sort of indirect tie to, uh, to, to everybody else by, by the latter um, period. So, so this, is, this is what I've been able to do, if you like, quantitatively on the basis of qualitative narrative sources. But the other thing that I want to try to do is to tell the story about what happened between here and here that brought about um, this change. And there are statistical methods for, for doing this. There are increasingly uh, statistical ways of trying to predict and, and explain how networks change and transform. Um, but uh, firstly, that's very difficult in relationship to real historical cases. I mean, if you go into a school on the first day of term and you do a network survey and then you go back six months later, you've got the data you need and you, you can do the business. If you're looking at historical events that have happened, uh, obviously no one was there with a questionnaire asking people the relevant information. And so you, you're kind of forced back on qualitative um, sources in order to, to try to, to determine what went on. Um, but actually, it's a very good, it's a very interesting way of, of doing that. And I, I actually have more snapshots than this. I've just put the first and the last here. I've got about four or five in between from, from, various, um, from various different points. But qualitative materials, at least in this case, if you've got a well-documented movement or a well-documented um, series of events, uh, the qualitative material is very good for reconstructing the processes and the mechanisms that were involved in transforming a network from one uh, state uh, to, to, to another. So that's, that's one example, I think, of where I'm kind of using the quantitative uh, overall approach, the quantitative mapping approach, and there are lots of measures that I can apply to in, in the way that I talked about at the start, to these various networks, but the qualitative is, is, the, is the source of the data in the first place and is also the source really of the explanatory um, material that, 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 I, uh, that, that, that I want to, to develop. So that's one um, example. Another thing that you can do, uh, again mentioned by Gemma, is to try to explore the content of ties. So this um, uh, th these both of these quotes, actually, in fact, they're both from the from the same guy, are from a project that I did on um, student activists at Manchester. So we we tracked and we traced the connections between um, be between political activists at uh, on campus over a over a twelve month period, um, and we had our diagrams and we could see who was most central and less central and where the concentrations were, um, and we had one particular very, very dense uh, neighbourhood within, within the network. There was a group of people who really seemed to be, um, it seemed as if everybody knew everybody. There were about 15, 20 of them, and it, it was this very sort of in, intense patch within the network, uh, and inter through, through interviews we were able to get some sort of sense of what was going on there. I mean, we knew, we had a sense of politically what was going on between these people, but we didn't know that much about their ties, about what they, what, what they did, how they related to one another. And this is just one quotation that, um, that, that helped us to shed some light upon that. So one of the interviewees said, we're just a big friendship group. We go for curries, we go drinking together, live together. I mean, he laughs there because, of course, within this very dense cluster, there were all kinds of romantic relationships and sort of serial romantic relationships. I think most people 
most of the girls had been out with most of the lads at some point in time over over this, this period. Um, we play Xbox really, you know, and so so there's this kind of just this sort of interesting sense because coming from social movement studies, we might be inclined to regard them as political comrades who sort of stand and march very solemnly together. And, and what we're getting from the interviews is a sense of, well, we do do that, but we also do lots of other things together as well. Um, and then this, this same guy goes on and, and gives us a, a kind of sense of why the relationships were important. Uh, so he says, when you have friends that aren't activists, they can't understand why you're getting up at six o'clock to go to a picket line or to go knocking on doors, campaigning in various groups. So it's good to have people around you who understand why you're doing it. And this related to a theory of that, that collective action is, is related to density within networks. The idea being that if everybody around you is doing that same thing, it makes it a lot easier for you to do it as well. If you're an activist on your own, and none of your friends are activists, it's very difficult to maintain the, the commitment um, to, to, to what it is that, that you're doing. And, and it's, it's shown, it comes out very nicely, very clearly in, in a qualitative um, interview. Also, um, e exploring the context of ties. This is a photograph from, from our ethnography. This is people and planet um, occupying the, the roof of the RBS on Oxford Road. Um, and, and because, I mean, the, the point here, I suppose, is that um, social network analysts are interested in relationships and we can become very insular about that. We can imagine that the only thing going on between people is their relationship, you know, that, that's what we're interested in. But, but in actual fact, networks most of the time come about in the course of people doing other things. Uh, you don't, I mean, people do go out to create networks, but very often people go out to do other things. They go out to become involved in politics. They go out to become involved in music. They, they have interests, and those, it's those interests that bring them together. And their, their relationships are actually framed by the wider context of the activity that, that they are involved in. And, and clearly, quantitative network analysis isn't going to tell us about that. It's not going to give us a sense of, of, of the, the, the broader contextual uh, domain of meaning that, that, uh, that, that, that these actors are, um, are, are involved in together. So in this case, we had an ethnography. Two minutes, by the way. Okay. Um, I think I've only got one more slide. Yeah, um, we, we had an ethnography. So we were able to follow, the, follow these people around to some extent, come along to the various events that some of them were involved in uh, like like this and to put the relationship in a broader in a broader picture um, make more sense of um, of it and, and of what 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 these people meant both to one another and and in what, what their co-activities meant to them and we were also able to explore the effects of ties uh, th this so one of the things that, that we looked at um, was one of the theories that we were exploring was the idea that, um, uh, that, that networks are a crucial part of, um, of, of why students are disproportionately likely to become involved in politics and particularly sort of radical um, politics. And lots of, we had lots of quotes to the effect of this top one here. I came from, because I think it was a small town and the school I went to was quite middle class, there wasn't really much going on and I think university, partly because you meet so many people, new people who've got different views or come from different backgrounds, goes on to say that's, that's what got me involved. So there was this kind of sense of, well it's because you have big concentrations of people and you have the opportunity for them to form networks, we argued, that, um, that, that, that generates the possibility for politicisation, it, it creates the possibility for people becoming involved in, um, uh, in in collective action of various sorts, and again, you we just couldn't have got that from I don't think from any other means than just qualitatively talking to, to people. Um, and this is, this is another example. This is from the from the punk stuff. You get loads of references in the punk stuff to to short hair because the punks came about in the mid seventies, and everybody was hippies very kind of long hair and one of the things that the punks did immediately was cut their hair 
very, very short. Um, but some of them were much more reluctant to do it than others. And you get lots of stories about people being cajoled and particularly people in bands and being forced to get their hair cut so that they fitted in with the new, the, the new punk image. So this is, um, this is a guy in, in a band called uh, Generation X. He says uh, he had really long hair. We rehearsed him every night for a week and on the Friday night he still had long hair on flared trousers because that was another thing that the, punk, the hippies had got big flares and the, the punks wanted short, kind of tight, um, skinny, skinny jeans. Uh, we were begging him the afternoon before the gig, he says, OK. We took him down to a hairdresser's and had his hair cut off in the nick of time. So, I mean, my, the, the, the kind of the serious element to this is that I'm interested in how a network was forming, but simultaneously that network was creating a new style. Within that network of people, a new idea, a new identity, a new sense of how you play music, what you look like, how you appreciate music, how you dance to it, and so on, was was taking shape. And that I, I, and the argument is that that happened because of mutual influence within these networks. It happened because people were coming up with ideas and then persuading one another to take those ideas on board, um, and such that eventually a kind of unified, relatively homogenous style started to emerge. And again, you can kind of approximate that in stati with, with statistical stuff if, if you're lucky enough to get the data. But you can often get right to the heart of that kind of influence through, through, through consultation of, of qualitative sources where they, um, where they exist.